Hey everybody, welcome to Virtual Night Sky. Uh, I'm pleased to, to welcome everybody to our May 18th, 2022 version of Virtual Night Sky. And Luna decided to join us for at least the first part. So uh, I think many of you saw Luna, at least maybe in pictures in the past. Here's the real deal. She had quite a busy week last week because there's nothing more important to my dog Luna than watching the moon. And uh, it really sort of showed us its tricks on Sunday night. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but for now, let me do some introductions. First, my name is Rick Alling, and I am the uh, a manager of community outreach programs for the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. And in that role, um, with my colleague Meg Hufford, who is also on the, uh, on the, the show tonight, uh, what we do is we organize to have people come visit us. And we have uh, sort of, we organize to do presentations and programs of all sizes and all shapes uh, and uh, before COVID, that was always on the university campus in our building. We have a beautiful building. If you haven't visited it yet, it's now open. You can come see us. Um, and uh, But when COVID started, we decided to kind of um, to go virtual a little bit. We wanted to keep our audience. We wanted to still talk to people. So uh, we planned and uh, created this particular program. Every other Wednesday night, we've been going for over two years now. And uh, uh, so it's... Uh, it's been quite a quite a journey, and we're we're going to go ahead and keep going for a while. Uh, tonight in the program, I'm going to uh, sort of uh, bring an astrophotographer on a little bit later. And Kevin O'Donnell was one of the ones that joined us in a broadcast about the um, um, uh, uh, the lunar eclipse. And so, um, and we'll be asking you in a poll later on if you took advantage of the eclipse and saw that. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, before that, uh, I'm going to invite. Uh, a professor from ASU, from the School of Earth and Space Exploration, an astrophysicist named uh, Dr. Patrick Young. And he's going to talk to us just a little bit, debrief us a little bit, if you want, about the, the news article that was about the black hole in the center of our galaxy. And so we'll get to that in a moment. Kim Baptista is on the line. She is the one that organizes this. She's the one that sent out the communications. She's the one that invited you to the program. And she works the web magic in the background to make sure everything goes. Alicia Hyatt is a staff her with us. She is a, uh, an education specialist. And tomorrow morning, she's going to be leading the charge of uh, kind of showing uh, 106 graders from uh, uh, at a local elementary school. Uh, the workings of the solar system and the universe. And so uh, so that's one of the things that we did pre-COVID and some of those schools are starting to come back and we're kind of excited about that. Alex Blanche, uh, you remember him, he's been with us almost through the whole program, I, I would say everything. And uh, Armandala are also a student, they're working in the background. Hey, uh, school is out, uh, graduation happened. <laughs> And we want to say a special goodbye to a couple of our own. So two of our docents have graduated and they're moving on, Nick Shea and Drew Shaw. And uh, both of them were sort of just really special to us. We get to know these people pretty well, these students. Uh, they work in our program. Some of them work in the front of house, right, doing tours of our facilities, and uh, and they engage with the public in various ways. And other students, and you see some of them on the screen uh, when we do our programs, work in the Marston Theater itself. And so uh, anyway, one of the really great things is we always get a new fresh batch of students that are really excited to join our programs and learn how to do what we do and become student workers. Uh, uh, and then the other sad side of it is after four years or so, they actually graduate and they move along. I guess that's what is supposed to happen. And so this time of year is a little bit bittersweet because we want to see them go off and do their great things. And uh, uh, But we also sort of will we'll miss them. Also on this show was a young man, a really outstanding young man and uh, going to be a great researcher. His name was Liam Nolan. You probably saw him if you're a regular on our show over the time. And he also just graduated with honors. And uh, we're sort of like, thank, say, thanks to say goodbye to Liam Nolan. Um, if you are uh, joining us for the first time, welcome aboard. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about how things work. Uh, this is a webinar, and so we don't have chat. You can communicate to us, though, and we want you to communicate to us through the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, all you have to do is just push that thing. It doesn't mean you have to really just ask a question. You can make a comment if you want. 
And uh, you can ask questions that we can uh, answer in the background. That's what some of the team does in the background. But we also bring some of those questions forward to uh, public view. And so as I have speakers tonight, first Patrick and then Kevin, uh, please just uh, don't hesitate to just sort of, if you have a thought, if you have an idea, if you did something like they did, uh, uh, then uh, go ahead and just sort of like put it in that, uh, that Q&A. And that's our main way to communicate with our audience and start chatting. Uh, so without any sort of further ado, uh, we'll get to sort of the rest of the show later, but we have a really tight window and I wanted to invite Dr. Patrick Young to the table. And uh, he is um, not only a uh, professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and not only uh, an astrophysicist, but he's also our boss. And so uh, it's nice, nice to see him there. I'm going to change my view, Patrick, a little bit just to set up uh, the uh, the question here. And so uh, I hear, because it was all over the news for uh, uh, everywhere you looked, everybody was talking about this amazing black hole thing in the center of our galaxy. And uh, so uh, I think we've known for a long time there's a black hole in the center of our galaxy. So I'm going to bring up some images and allow you to sort of introduce yourself a little bit. And then let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing and what that means and why it's so special and what happened now to make this special. Let me just put, throw an image on the screen here so we have that in the background. So Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great to be here, um, however briefly. So as Rick said, the biggest astronomy news in the last week or so is this image of the black hole at our galaxy's center, which, okay, to first approximation, looks like kind of a lumpy donut. And in fact, Krispy Kreme was giving out free donuts the day <laughs> after this image was released. Um, but what we're really looking at is something truly amazing. Um, Rick, if you want to go to that image of the galaxy and exactly. fly us in to the very center. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Just a second. <clears throat> so in the very center of our galaxy and pretty much every galaxy we know about, it turns out that there is a black hole at the very center that weighs millions or even billions of times what our sun does. And this black hole in the center of the galaxy has a lot of effects on its surroundings. And as we go further and further in here, you, you will see. You, yeah, as you see that little thing, that's actually just sort of like a small marker for the center of the galaxy. And uh, so, so, sorry about that, go ahead. Sure, and as you um, go in towards the center of the galaxy, you will pass stars, clouds of gas and dust, and so on. And then what you are seeing here is the stars that are very closest to the center of our galaxy that are orbiting this black hole. And by watching the orbits of those stars, we were able to confirm that there was a very massive, very dense object at the center of our galaxy, about 4 million times the mass of our own sun packed into such a small space that a black hole is basically the only thing it could be, but we still couldn't image it. So the strategy was to take a group of radio telescopes spread all over the earth and put them together to make one huge telescope capable of resolving that tiny little dot in the center of our galaxy. If you could go back to the black hole image. Sure, one moment, here we go. So, the very center of this image, that dark space, is the event horizon of the black hole. That is the region from which not even light can escape. And for the Milky Way's black hole, it's about the size of a tenth the distance from the sun to the Earth's orbit. So that may seem like a lot to us, but at a distance of 25 times 10 trillion kilometers times a thousand, that's an extremely tiny area. So we needed a telescope the size of the earth to produce this image. And the orange is actually hot gas that is moving around the black hole and emitting in 
all different wavelengths, but particularly in radio waves, which are sort of the easiest things to use to build one of these giant patchwork telescopes that we call an interferometer. Could you bring up the image with M87 in it as well? Yeah, so we have, this is a kind of a double image here. <laughs> so some of you may remember a similar image to this coming out last year, and that's on your left here. It's the black hole in the center of the galaxy M87. It was produced with the same technique, but M87 is a galaxy that's, I believe, about 55 million light years away from us. So much, much farther than the center of our galaxy, which is only about 25,000 light years away. But the black hole in the center of M87 is a couple of billion times the mass of our sun. And I actually so, have, let me just throw another image out here. I just found this one. You haven't seen it yet, but this is sort of a compare. This is what you were talking about, comparison of, of the size. So. Great. That's exactly where I was going. The event horizon in M87 is bigger than our entire solar system. So it actually turned out that looking at that black hole far, far away was easier to do for this telescope than looking at the one in the center of our own galaxy or roughly the same level of difficulty. But um, this is, these two are the first direct images of a black hole ever to be produced. Um, let's see, and I want to be able to answer some questions before I have to step off. So if there are- Yeah, any, I know you're on a timeline. Let's go ahead. I'm going to get uh, the guys in the background just to sort of if there are any questions to bring forward, this would be a great time. And also just to show you another image I sort of found. This is sort of, a, again, a little sort of sketch of how far away those objects are. So you can see there's a big difference between 27,000 light years away to the center of our galaxy. And what's that say? 55 million light years away to the center of another galaxy uh, in an object called M87. Um, the other thing I can show just as you're sort of like just wrapping up is uh, this image also sort of came out and oops, I'm not going to use that one. Sorry. This image also came out and it shows essentially some wavelength at the bottom. So when when we produce an image like this that's in radio waves that we really can't see with our own eyes, what do researchers do to sort of like make a model or use that information in radio to make an image that we can look at on the screen or a page like this? How does that work? Yeah, so essentially radio waves are a kind of light that we can't see. So we can take the brightness in radio waves and translate it into a brightness in the vis visible wavelengths that our eyes can actually detect. So we assign a random color to it, essentially. In this case, the group chose oranges and yellows. But if you could see in the radio with this kind of resolution, you would see this structure with three bright areas in it and a little bit of stuff streaming off. And if you looked at it through say if you looked at an image uh, in visible light through a piece of clear blue film, you would see the blue colored things coming through, the rest of the light would be blocked. And you could see the red light with a red film. Essentially what you're looking at here is different colors of radio light. And you can see down at the bottom here that those blobs in that disc-like structure are very much brighter than their surroundings in one color of radio light, but not in the others. And that information can tell us stuff like the temperature and density of the gas and other conditions of the material. It's absolutely outstanding. So, so you were really pleased to see this come out, right? Not to, oh, not to learn that there's a new black hole in the center of our galaxy. We've known this for a while. I think uh, 1977 or 1974 is when I looked it up that we sort of first detected it. Um, but this is, I guess, importantly, 
the first image, right? And can is that what we're saying? And is that the uh, first first time we can actually image the black hole? Yes, that's exactly it. We've sort of inferred the existence of a black hole by progressively progressively saying that more and more material has to be packed into a smaller and smaller volume to the point where we can say a black hole is the only thing that is physically possible to do this. But now we've actually taken a picture and seen that emptiness at the heart of the galaxy. Excellent. Well, thank you, Patrick. I know you're on a tight timeline. I kind of took you out of a regular schedule, but thanks for coming on our program. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate you talking about this with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Let me go back to my image. Uh, so uh, anyway, so uh, what's wonderful about working at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and especially in an outreach capacity, is, is we have a wonderful relationship with professors like Patrick, and there's 65 or 70 professors in our program. They're, they're kind of divided between astrophysics and geophysics and everything in between. Uh, so usually there's a subject matter expert just ready and uh, willing to come on and talk to us about these things. In a couple of weeks on June 1st, we're actually going to talk about exoplanets. And you're going to meet another professor named Jenny Patience, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later in the program. But that's really one of the things that uh, makes makes working there really wonderful is access to this amazing database of knowledge. This is super cool. Uh, my next guest and what we really wanted to get to tonight, our big plan uh, over uh, the last month or so, is to uh, kind of get back into astrophotography a little bit. We happen to know our audience likes astrophotography and likes learning about it. And we have come to sort of make a really good friend in the community, You'll meet Kevin O'Donnell here in a second. Uh, and uh, we really wanted to sort of like bring back some of the things, some of the images that people around us took during the lunar eclipse of last Sunday. So use that as sort of like the model. Here's a real event, and we'll show you some real images that sort of came out of that event. But Kevin is gonna dig a little bit deeper and tell you how he makes his images, how he does his craft, why he does his craft. And so uh, let me bring him to the screen. We'll introduce real quick, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, turn, the, turn the program over to Kevin in a moment. Hey, Kevin, how are you? I'm good, thank you so much, Rick. Is it, can we pin both of us? There we go. I just wanted to sort of like see that. So, so what is 50? What are we celebrating there? Uh, well, it's a couple of years old, but I went out <laughs> okay. to Cape Canaveral during the uh, 50th anniversary. They had a Good. big party. It was pretty amazing. Actually, our audience knows we have just we have just covered the 50 of this and the 50 of that, starting with Apollo 11. But they all came out within about three years of each other, three and a half years. And so the 50th anniversary of all of the missions have been rolling out. And uh, you might remember uh, uh, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Apollo 16 about two months ago. And there's one more to go. So we'll have a, we'll have another one before before we get through the 50s. Anyway, well, good for you. So you've been a space enthusiast for a while. I'm guessing, right? Well, it's always been a, yeah, it's always been a, to go out to Cape Canaveral is a different um, element altogether because a lot of people are in awe of, of the rockets and the size. And I encourage everybody to look at it and see yep. it. I mean, scheduling a launch is, is a little tough because they get scrubbed a lot. Um, but just being there and seeing uh, what they've um, put together it's a pretty amazing experience to go out there. Well, I have never been, but I am going. So Kim and I, and us in, in particular, are going to, uh, well, the plan is we'll go to Florida at the end of the summer, and we're going to do one of our broadcasts from Florida. So we'll sort of, think, uh, we'll sort of do that. One of our, our Wednesday broadcasts will be from there. So hopefully that will work out. Well, I don't want to take uh, take uh, uh, sort of the time we had for you to present. So let me, uh, if you want to kind of, I think you had some slides you want to show. And I'd like to have the audience learn a little bit more about you and your background, what you do and and what why why this passion of astrophotography is. So, so sure. uh, off you go. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and I'd like to make it interactive, so I probably will, um, you know, ask for input here and there. Um, I definitely Actually, want, yeah. before you start, let me just make that appeal again. Audience, right, don't forget to ask questions. So as uh, as Kevin is going to this program, if you think of something you'd like to know about or know more about, uh, go ahead and use that button. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, get in there, sort of ask a question as we go. Thanks, Kevin. Sure. 
So hopefully you guys can see my screen. Did this come up? Yep, that looks really so good. Be there. Um, and this is a shot I took up in Flagstaff, as well as the one behind me in my virtual background. So uh, I know some of the folks that are on the call aren't necessarily from the Phoenix area, but you know we we have what's called Bortle levels here of, of different darkness. A Bortle nine being sort of the um, the city itself, so downtown where um, the suns would play, let's say. And um, a border one would be um, the middle of nowhere, if you will. So um, where there's no city lights of, or light pollution, and there's various apps you can look for, um, but best rule of thumb is get away from the people if you wanna have some dark skies out there. And so typically astrophotographers um, don't really like the moon very much <laughs> because um, during the, the moon filled nights, uh, we tend to uh, not take many pictures of the sky um, we watch a basketball game instead or something, or do some real science. What I liked, what, what we were um, started with was all the real science. What I'm gonna present is a little more art. I have, to, um, I have to work with some real science in order to get the images that I like and, and so on. But um, for the most part, I'm not a scientist, I'm a photographer. Um, but we are gonna focus on the lunar eclipse because that happened on Sunday. And um, we have uh, some questions later, I think, um, around that. But I want to show just a quick portfolio. So instead of a whole slide deck, I'm just going to click on this one image of mine. So in this one image is about um, 20 of my favorite types of things that I take. So uh, I was an amateur photographer, um, you know, on the side, I, I have a job where I, I get to work on professional videography. And I, I then scaled up over time. And it's always good to sort of specialize. And I really took off with astrophotography. Uh, about eight years ago, I started uh, getting hooked, really seeing eclipses because they happen so frequently, um, at least lunar eclipses. And um, so here's just like a variety of my work, everything from sort of the deep sky images that we call stacks, so the um, Andromeda galaxy, which is in the center here, um, to quick photos. So the, the International Space Station in the lower right corner is literally like one three thousandth of a second single photo as it flew by at 17,500 miles an hour. So um, I'm, I, it's my, my range is very broad. I like landscapes, I like deep sky images, and technically that eclipse shot, the solar eclipse shot up there is a day shot because that's when solar eclipses take place. And on the interactive side, I heard you on the last call, Rick, talking about how you also um, went to the solar eclipse. Um, it was a fantastic experience for me. I highly encourage everybody to go to the one happening in 2024 that's coming up. So just two years away, but don't wait till the last minute because those are really tough to book hotels and airfare. They're a big deal because they don't happen very frequently. Um, however, lunar eclipses, um, and do you want to comment on that actually, Rick, on the solar eclipse a bit? Yeah, so um, uh, one of the things that um, that I was uh, I really enjoyed going to the other the last eclipse in the one in uh, Wyoming, because I was also out there with a team of students uh, and my wife. So we both went and our dog and we sort of met a professor and a team of students that were doing a really special project. And to be around those kids uh, doing something like this for the first time in their lives as well. Uh, I sort of witness them doing something that will just basically, this will be with them forever. Uh, uh, they were actually doing some research. They were launching an infrared camera on a balloon and taking pictures of the earth underneath the eclipse. Uh, and just the, the detail that they went into getting prepared for that and the, you know, how that worked, it was absolutely amazing. So the phenomenon itself was amazing, but how it impacted these youngsters as I sort of was able to you know, kind of tag along on this particular trip. And I understand the same professor is planning something in 2024, so I'll probably do that. And then there's another big one in 2025. So, so always something to look forward to, right? <clears throat> Yeah, and it was for us, it was a community sort of experience as well. It just so happened that a lot of other astrophotographers and scientists were staying in that same hotel and set up in that same field outside. <laughs> so you could just walk around and other people had interesting experiments set up. For instance, one just had a sheet of white um, cloth on the ground and he had a box of Cheetos. So a little hole in, the, in, in a cracker. And as you held that up, you could get little crescents of the sun all over the globe. So people were 
you know, on this paper that was on the ground. So, and he had like a cheese grater, anything that had a circle in it could make this sort of um, partial eclipse um, halo on the ground. So lots of things to learn and lots of people had more expensive equipment. And it was great to have that community because then there were people that were counting it down, right? Saying five minutes and 30 seconds and all this. And so it was just very exciting. I, I highly encourage people to do that as opposed to just going somewhere totally remote. Um, what I will do from a nostalgic standpoint is I'm gonna show my first partial lunar eclipse since we're gonna talk about lunar eclipses. So this is from 2011. So this is 11 years ago, right? That I went out and took some pictures. Um, and the reason you could tell it's partial is because you don't see the classic sort of blood red moon look to it. Um, and this isn't even with some very professional equipment. This is just with a standard point and shoot camera. So if people ask like, how much equipment do I need? What do I need? Well, this was a point and shoot camera. And lately I've seen some fantastic photography just with people using their cell phones. So it's a great and inexpensive way to see if it's something that you love and then sort of invest more if you want. Um, so I would, I would add, you've got to have a really stable base, right? So a nice tripod, right? So I, I always encourage people, you know, spend a little money on a tripod because that's, that's going right. to make, make a big difference. But, but the moon is bright enough to capture, it doesn't take a lot of time, right? Then it's probably just a, a, a fraction of a second a shot. Fraction right? of a second, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, especially before it becomes the full blood, classic blood moon where you're taking several seconds on a tracker and so on. Saying, at yeah. this point, it's just as bright as it would be, you know, at um, a, a, a half moon, right, or a three quarter, 80%, um, let's say, moon. And the reason I don't have a blood moon in this is the thing about lunar eclipses is we're lucky that they haven't frequently even over your house, right? With a solar eclipse, you could live in Arizona for the next hundred years and a solar eclipse is not going to go over your house. It's just how it works. But lunar eclipses can happen. There's two of them this year. One just happened um, May 15th, which was Sunday. The next one's on November 8th. So um, they can happen frequently. There was two last year. There's two this year. So it's something I definitely encourage people to go out and look at. This one, because you're only seeing a partial, it's because it was happening at like four in the morning and basically it set before it became full. And that's very common. That's why we don't see them sometimes. They're paths of totality. And so you might get a spot on the earth where they are experiencing a lunar eclipse where we aren't here. And this, in this case, I couldn't get the full lunar eclipse. I could only get a partial before the sun came up. So it's a beautiful move on. Yeah, so this was another one. It was also um, early morning. It was just before sunrise and so on. This is from 2018. And this was in January. Um, so that's really where it was on the horizon. That's really where my camera was. I have a slightly better gear now, but um, that's what it looks like if you're trying to figure out looks, what you wish to This see. looks like a, a Canon camera, right? That mm -hmm. anybody, anybody might own? That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I highly encourage sort of the um, modular cameras where you can remove lenses, right? Because you can buy point and shoot ones or even really nice ones that have a built-in lens. But if you can remove the lens and you can get wide angle shots, like some of those landscapes I've shown, you can get a little closer. Um, and so like the next shot is um, from 2019. It's a little closer. It's not great. It was a cloudy night. If anybody remembers January, we've had a little bit of luck with clouds actually in, the, in, in Arizona. <laughs> with some, with some of our lunar even, even three days ago. That's right. Um, and then I will fast forward to um, May of last year. So we had a fairly clear night enough to take some good photos. And um, if you want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing here, I, I would love to hear some of the science because, you know, when you go out and you take a partial moon, right, you're not taking a full moon phase, you always see a very hard edge. But what's really interesting about the lunar eclipses is you get to kind of see, you know, all phases of the moon from bright, fully bright to, to right. dark in the same night. Yeah, and and I think uh, what always surprises me a little bit is is just that the especially when it starts, it's not a very it's not a distinct sharp line between light and dark. Uh, uh, I mean, you can definitely tell, but it's more like a little fuzzy blob. And I always try to imagine 
what people would think if they didn't know there was going to be a lunar eclipse and you know things start happening to the moon that you just you know kind of are just weird right you're used to the moon and it just doesn't do that and uh, i always wonder what people would have thought about that back in the day when you didn't you couldn't predict these you didn't have the newspaper saying get ready and uh, now we sort of like get the newspaper had exactly what time each phase was going to start everything was going to happen uh, back in the old days right you just sort of like watch the moon sometimes it would do something funny. I just I love uh, the fact these are uh, the mare. This is sort of on the the eastern side of the moon, as we or the right hand side as we look at it. If if the north is at the top, and uh, yeah, I think that's really super cool. It's good. Yeah, and so from the same night, um, this was uh, you know totality. It was still a uh, well. This one was a full lunar eclipse. So this was the uh, May one was a full lunar eclipse. Um, now in this eclipse, Kevin, if I if I remember right, um, because I was out taking some pictures of this too, it did become a full eclipse. But it, this is a see that light limb on the top there, uh, that's a, as as dark as that got. So it basically the one we saw three days ago, the moon passed exactly through the center of the shadow. In this particular case, it's kind of passing sort of towards the edge of the shadow. So there's a little sort of like, um, uh, there's a little extra light on the top part of this image. Um, and uh, yep, yep, total, but it sort of just, it would, it never really got totally dark. And it would, uh, this uh, light part would decline to about this point and then start to grow again. So it does, it, the alignment matters. And uh, uh, two, three days ago, the one we saw was actually a really perfect alignment for us. Yeah, and also I saw a chart just before the one on Sunday where someone had put out where they showed sort of the quality of lunar eclipses. So there's even oh, really? some okay. on that. Yeah, yeah, so, and it obviously was based on, you know, high, how, how high it is off the horizon. So it's very pretty to take one low on the horizon with some nice background, but if you want a clearer shot, you really not need to get out right. of the mud, right? have to you know, high. Um, and then, like you said, there's some alignment that um, factors into how orange or, uh, or bold this uh, lunar eclipse is going to look. And what's interesting here is now you can see stars. So when else can you see a full moon and also see stars yeah. only during your lunar eclipse? Um, and this is about a two second exposure. So the other night when, when I was taking some photos, um, you know, I was showing them right away, but it's not what you see, right? Because it's still very dim. And then the camera takes and captures all of that light. In just two seconds, it can capture so much more than what you can see. So there's very little processing here. I maybe boosted the, the saturation just a touch and the, and the contrast, but it's pretty much what I saw on my screen at the time. So it's great. And then if I move on to the November one, it was a little clearer. We had less clouds during the November one. So shortly, I'm going to show you a time lapse of what that looked like. Um, because, you know, you can set up a time lapse and you can take all these phases, but if clouds roll through, you don't get as great of a shot. This in November was definitely a cleaner one from where my vantage point was. So uh, any more comments on the Terminator line here? No, no, I think this is great. This is all yeah. really, really beautiful. Yeah. And then so this was the totality of that one by comparison. Now we have this, you know, bright spot closer to the bottom. This one was a partial to, to my memory. So this was still a, a lunar eclipse, but a partial lunar eclipse in November. And so moving on to the ones from Sunday, because that's what we wanted to show is some of the, the showcase of things that we were able to take. I just selected four of my favorites. I took probably 100 okay. shots or more. Um, well, this, this is reminiscent of what I saw, right? Because yeah. um, it's the, the moon is still low, almost next to the horizon here, I see from the cactus. Um, yeah. But I was also getting these sort of these funny little shadows were moving moving by as as uh, as it was rising. But it was all right. It was actually kind of a little spooky and mysterious looking. Yeah, I mean, when the clouds come out, you get very disappointed as an astrophotographer. But then, if something like this happens, it's kind of a lucky moment. Yeah, and so it's a, it's a beautiful shot. I love the way that works. And then um, this is the same area I was in, um, and you can start to see as I. As I um, expose for a lot of the brightness, you can start to see that that blood red coming out in the lower um, corner, mm -hmm. which you can't see with the re regular exposures. So when I go to the next shot, it's basically the same time frame, but I'm not I'm exposing so you can see the lighter parts. So compare that to this right here, where you don't see that sort of red portion down there because I'm I'm, I'm closing down my iris. I'm taking 
you know, a, a darker shot as you, as it go along. Right. I get it. Yeah. And good. then I went through each of these little phases and I made them a sequence just so we could kind of okay. see how it vanished. Yeah. That's great. So we got that where it's starting to go. <laughs> This and one, people you, were getting pretty excited, right? If they had did you use the same, did the same time period, like every 10 minutes or something like that? Or how did you do this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I took I took tons, right? So oh, okay. it was like, All right. I so, went back and selected what I thought were sort of um, good phases and some clouds rolled through at different times. And I don't have those on here, just that initial shot. Uh, and then there was like this little sliver. Oh, yeah, those are again. beautiful. And now we're getting just a little bit of stars out there. You can see that. And then this was my totality shot from Sunday. Okay, so now the moon is completely in shadow, but what you're you're expending, you're extending the time that the shutter is open now, right? So how long is this? Is this about a two, this seconds? two seconds? Two seconds, yeah. Yeah, and, and believe it or not, even two seconds is too long to take a photo without what's called a star tracker. Yeah. So oh, I, have, I, I always thought yeah. the rule of thumb was like, I don't know, I thought it was five or six seconds, but I, I think well, it so, depends on yeah, your... Yeah, so they use this 500 photo. rule, um, yeah. and I'll just throw that math out there just for people that don't have a tracker and you're doing like a wide angle shot and so on. What it basically says is that you take um, the number 500 and you divide it by whatever your focal length is. So a 50 millimeter lens, let's say, that means you can shoot for 10 seconds before you're gonna start getting some star blurring. So if you know that math up front, you know you shouldn't be taking you know, 20 seconds or 30 seconds at, at a tighter focal length. Well, this is at 600 millimeters. This is the furthest focal length I have. So okay. I could maybe take like a quarter second before this moon would be a little bit blurry. So to resolve that, there's a small device called a star tracker and you just put it on a tripod. It's a lot lower tech than having a big telescope with a tracking mount and so on. It's pretty inexpensive and they come in lots of different um, sizes and for what you know type of equipment that you have. And then there's like this polar alignment. There's a little scope and you just pointed at Polaris, right? So the North Star, and um, it will rotate along um, with you, or should I say counteract the rotation of the Earth. And um, there's also a moon setting on it. So, you know, the stars move at a different pace. There's a sun setting on it. There's a moon setting on it and so on. Um, and that's how I'm able to take longer exposures. But still with the moon, you're only still taking a couple of seconds. You're not taking minutes. If I took even five seconds, it was super bright. You just know? start to blur out. Okay. And then yeah. there's a, I'll just add a little science here, the, the reason for the red, right? And so some full moons are actually redder than others. And, uh, but what you're seeing essentially is uh, the, the light as it passes through the Earth's atmosphere is, uh, is disrupted. So the same kind of conditions that cause a rainbow that separate the colors of red and, and you know, a red, orange, yellow, blue, green, the sort of the, the, the colors of the rainbow, um, uh, our atmosphere has a tendency to scatter blue light. It just sends it off in all directions. And in this particular case, the earth itself, this, with its atmosphere, focuses red light kind of around uh, and uh, back towards the moon. So that's really why we get that blood color. What's interesting is sometimes you'll see lunar eclipses where there has been some sort of major activity in the atmosphere, like I can remember the Iceland volcano of, uh, of I guess this is probably about eight years ago now, a big volcano in Iceland sent a whole bunch of ash up there, and we could actually see a different color in the lunar eclipse because of what was happening in our atmosphere, and that was all, that was pretty fascinating for, for researchers and scientists. So. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so this is just a wider shot of the same night, just to, so you see that there were some clouds, but there also uh, were some stars. So, um, you know, and then I don't have phases after this because those clouds on the right just came by. Yeah, and, that's yeah, that, thanks for me. That was so my I, experience. Had same <laughs> going. I, we managed to get it into totality, and then um, it just, just sort of the clouds came in and kind of absorbed it, but. After we stopped the broadcast, right, at whatever, that was about 9.15, I packed up, I drove home, I was at a friend's house, and uh, uh, I just sat on my patio and watched the end. So it just- it Totally was, cleared up, of course. You know, like it was blocks. beautiful and sort of, uh, uh, that was great. Anyway, that was, a, what a great experience. Well, how, uh, how great it was for you. I wanted to do, just add one more thing, because uh, I know you to be sort of an intrepid person, right? So I sent out a call to lots of friends, you know, people that have telescopes 
telescopes, people that have their own rigs, people have all this kind of stuff and said, hey, how about it? Do you want to be part of the show? And almost all of them said, nope, too close to the horizon, right? They have they have sheds or they have you know things where, or they live in the city or whatever, their setup wasn't uh, uh, in a place where they can actually sort of get to the Eastern horizon, which you kind of had to do in this particular case to see at least the beginning of the eclipse. And, uh, but uh, you said, no, I'm gonna go someplace, right? I'll find a place where I can get the horizon. So tell me a little bit about, I mean, kind of you, you're not doing this from you from your lawn chair in your backyard, right? You're going out, you're finding the right location in the right moment, right? I'm lucky to live um, in what's called a Bortle Six, so I'm, I'm just on that fringe where it starts to get a bit dark, and I have I have sort of a slot, if you will, right? There's trees behind me, there's a roof line, but I have a pretty good slot. I can take um, pictures of a lot of um, like right now, tonight, you know, before the moon would come up, I could go out and take pictures of uh, like the Whirlpool Galaxy. I have a pretty clear view of that and okay. so on. Um, so I can take, I can take um, decent shots, but there is a big difference. So I will recommend for folks to go out to a deep sky. So like this picture behind me where you can see the Milky Way, it's very clear. That was, that was only like a one minute shot. Um, and it's only a stack of like five photos. That's literally like five minutes of photography and there's just no way that you could do that from my backyard. There's no way I could see the Milky Way that clearly. Um, but also it's so dark out there that you can fumble around with your gear. You have to get used to what you're working with. And there's elk on the road. So I definitely advise people to take it slow in some of these dark areas. Now, this one that I can show, this is from November. This was at the park across the street because I knew it was going to swing over my whole um, backyard. So this is five hours in 10 seconds. Oh, yeah, let me see. That would be great. So, and it should loop here, so you guys can watch it a few times. But this is 300 photos that I took, um, and it's basically every photo, there's there's one minute intervals, okay? So basically, there's a minute between every shot that you're seeing, and video runs at 30 frames a second. So that's how the math of five hours comes out to 300 frames. Basically, I was taking, you know, 60 photos an hour. Um, and then I take all these into... Um, Photoshop and Lightroom and, um, you know, brighten where I need to and so on. And then I um, create an animation out of this. Um, That's but a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Actually, the biggest work is what's called registering. Registering when we stack um, star photos, there's software that can help us. It can find a bunch of stars. It can match them. So when the sky moves, it, it corrects for that. In the case of this, um, I just couldn't find a great way to sort of register them to get all of them to line up. So I manually lined up all 300 frames. I literally zoomed in on every frame. And this is a 4K file that I have out there. But it's just fascinating to me to be able to see the whole five hours in like 10 seconds. Um, you know, because you're waiting and you don't really see all this change happen. A lot of people ask me too, well, you're obviously making some adjustments. Well, that's why I have the one minute in between, right? So as it's, the sky started to darken, the, the moon started to darken, I go in and I started taking longer shots. So I started at one five hundredth of a second, and by the end I was at two seconds. So there's little intervals about every two frames or so near the end I started going down and, and making the exposures longer. That's that's a lot of work. That's amazing. Well, well, thank you for your uh, for your uh, work. I mean, this is really amazing. And thanks for participating in our program last Sunday. I think people really appreciate it. Hey, uh, Kevin, can I show you some images? Uh, yeah, so and then this we'll is get back for a little close. Uh, so we asked some of our people to uh, sort of like come up. Maybe you can pin me back to the screen. And uh, so there's a, a, a one of our uh, colleagues that works over at Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera. It's a one of our facilities on campus. In fact, they were also guests on the Lunar Eclipse uh, program. Um, he took his own uh, images, and I just thought they were really wonderful. This is so you don't really we didn't talk about it much, but uh, uh, the the eclipse doesn't have to happen on the horizon. And some people thought that was a bother, but other people took advantage of that, right? So so this is really. Beautiful. Beautiful to see it and the uh, and uh, of course the cactus uh, and so and he's got really a, a really beautiful focus on his camera. Let's see if I can show you another one here. Uh, oops, that looks like the same one. Um, he took um, a handful. Here's a 
here's one kind of this whole image. His name is Aaron Boyd. I'm sorry, I forgot to just kind of use his name. But Aaron's been on our show before. Uh, he's been sort of a friend to outreach over on our end of campus quite a little bit. He's really brings a lot to the table. He's been with the Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter team for a long, long time, uh, the camera team. Uh, and here's one of his uh, where it's kind of that that uh, partial. And I thought this worked out really, really well for him or for uh, uh, for an image. I thought this was really beautiful. Let me see if I can get it uh, just a little bit uh, more in focus here. Anyway, I love the colors. They're a little bit different. Uh, the clarity of the seas, the mare that are up at the top of the screen. I thought that was great. And then um, right after the event, it was actually within hours after the event, a friend of all of ours, somebody that's in the, uh, uh, and kind of does a lot of astrophotography and stuff, uh, uh, he delivered this one. Look, <laughs> and we all sort of got a big kick out of this. Look at, look what's going on here. So in this particular case, uh, uh, the, the photographer's name is Tom Palakis, and uh, he was a guest on our show about a year ago. We'll get him back again. Uh, uh, but he actually sort of talked a friend into flying their little hang glider thing. And then he was in a position where he could sort of get, of course, uh, the hang glider and the guy in the same image. And uh, I always thought that was really, really clever. That I don't know if this is a tremendous amount of skill or a tremendous amount of luck or a little bit of both, but, uh, but it was sort of fun to see him turn in this particular image. Um, uh, let me um, ask if, um, if, if, if Tom or Kevin, if you don't mind, if you sort of um, uh, uh, can take some audience questions. I don't know. I'm going to ask the team if they have anything to bring forward. Anybody have anything for, Tom, for Kevin? Yeah, we do have some questions. We, we have some questions uh, regarding some beginner starting. We've had a lot of good questions about the eclipse and the moon. Um, but Jessica asks, one, she just says that what a great advocate for science astrophotographers are and thanks for the pictures and is eager to get connected on socials and stuff like that but um also just in general i know telescopes and equipment is always a big discussion but just what are some general tips and recommendations for beginners yeah so i mean rick and i talk about this a lot because um everybody asks those types of questions and i don't own a telescope i actually only own camera equipment um and so you know digital technology has changed things quite a bit um, visually, you can see things you can you can set, you know, years ago, you could take a telescope out there and look at the moon or look at the rings of Saturn, but it was very difficult to take photography of that. Um, when when I sort of came into taking photography, it was digital. I used DSLR cameras. Now I have a mirrorless camera. And so I just use various lenses on those cameras and um, you know decide what I want to do. Do I want to take a landscape but I want to hike out on a trail at Arches National Monument and take some beautiful landscapes? Or do I want to zoom in and take something, a deep sky photography photo? Um, I will say that if you if your goal is to take um, you know the most amazing photos of, of deep sky images, like things that you would see that look like Hubble and so on, a lot of people will go the telescope route. They buy you know, fairly expensive telescopes with dedicated cameras and uh, equipment to do that. That will get you better results for the deeper sky images. But there's a curve, right? There's everything from this landscape behind me to I just want to take some pictures of Jupiter or something. Or there's somebody that might want to take literally 40 hours worth of photos, right? They just have their telescope taking night after night pictures out there. And then they use stacking software because they want to make something that looks as good as Hubble. And that's actually possible. I mean, obviously, Hubble has better optics, and we're going to see a lot more from um, the web telescopes. It's but yeah, exactly. But you know, from your backyard, especially if you have a dark sky, you can take a lot. So my advice is, um, sorry, that was long winded. But my advice is just buy um, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, and I prefer something scalable. So you know, there are all in one tools out there. In fact, there are telescope companies now that literally make a telescope that has a camera built into it and has a GPS and you just pull it out of the box, stick it on your patio, load their app and you can say, I want to take a picture of Orion. It'll set itself up. It'll um, uh, pull or align and it will start shooting pictures to your phone. And maybe that's all you want to do. They're pricier because you're paying for that convenience and so on. 
but it all depends on sort of the scale that you're looking for. We, we got one of those, a new one, and um, I've been having fun playing with it. So I'm, uh, I'm going to take it on a little trip next week too. So, so, so thanks. Yeah, and um, yeah, I guess it 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 doesn't take a tremendous amount of money, but if you have the passion, I think you sort of just you'll know where to dive in and start working, and then you'll know what uh, what works for you, what works best, and then 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 try, kind of do shows like this, talk to other people that do the same thing. It's really is a it's a great community of uh, of of people like like Kevin and and uh, and it's really not your first job, right? That's the other cool thing about it. Yeah, and to your point, there are there are a lot of welcoming groups out there. So I mean, there are forums out there on Facebook and other uh, platforms with, you know, tens of thousands of folks that also are doing this. So they've been very helpful to me. Everybody's usually pretty nice. They, you know, will welcome you in and answer important questions. And you'll see people's images ramp up very quickly because of that advice. Oh, that's right. You can actually watch them grow, right? So that's yes, right. They, they got it. That's super, super cool. Well, there's lots of lots of technology available to us now. Uh, any other questions, guys? Nope. Uh, lots of lots of great comments about great photography and stuff such as those. So super. great so presentation. Kevin. Kevin, why don't you hang around for a bit because we're going to ask people some poll questions about the lunar eclipse you might be interested in, and uh, and uh, then after that, uh, I'm going to show people something to look for in the night in the morning sky uh, coming up. It's the moon again, but uh, this time a little different than in the morning, and uh, and then we'll start to wrap up the program. So uh, so how about it, Alicia? Who's running the polls tonight? And if you kind of give us a couple of poll questions. Let's see. This is where we find out from the audience if uh, you guys took advantage of the lunar eclipse. And so, uh, so let's go ahead. That's and right. There are, actually, there are actually two questions here. They're just, we made it easy on everybody. Two questions and they're only a yes or no. So you can uh, sort of like uh, uh, figure that out. That'll be good. Yes, so go ahead and cast your votes below. Our first question, did you view the lunar eclipse on and join us for a virtual lunar eclipse? Party? Um, so it looks like about 60 had answered. So I can go ahead and share those results. Now we're about 64. Alrighty, so it looks like 88% of us did watch the lunar on Sunday night. That's awesome. A great majority of us. Uh, and then our second question, did you join us virtual lunar eclipse party? Uh, looks like most of us did. Uh, 40 of us did. 60. So uh, awesome. We're so happy to see you <laughs> back for a recap. Yep, good. That was uh, that was actually a lot of hard work. If you saw what we were trying to do for two hours and fifteen minutes, and for those of you that didn't join us, uh, uh, we'll find other opportunities to actually. We'd, we'd sort of live this idea about watching live phenomena and doing it live. And so it wasn't meant to be a distraction from you going out and looking at the moon, right? You're supposed to do both. Uh, but uh, we actually had some, we made some friends and we kind of worked with a little team, uh, an astrophysicist and uh, some people in Chile, in the country of Chile. And so we actually had uh, views from the Southern hemisphere of the same lunar eclipse that we're watching from the Northern hemisphere. We also had a great little link and a partnership uh, with Lowell Observatory up in Northern Arizona so uh, we used the phenomenon of the lunar eclipse and sort of the in, in excitement about it to actually sort of like uh, get some, uh, make some friends and do some things collaboratively. So we enjoyed that quite a little bit. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am uh, just going to uh, share another screen with you real quick. Um, for those of you that's kind of watch the show often, I just so you sort of see what I've got going here. This is a, a planetarium program I use. It is so simple. This is on my laptop and I'm able to share the laptop screen with you. And uh, let me just tell you what I'm looking at here. So this is in the Eastern horizon and you can see the sun is just below the horizon there. And so this is before sunrise. If you've been watching the show regularly for a while, you have known that, that one of the big phenomenon happening to us right now is that all of the planets are basically um, uh, Eastern uh, oriented or morning oriented right at the moment. They're on the side of the sun where they appear in the morning, not the evening. Uh, 
So last year, at the end of the year, remember, in fact, I think I saw an image from Kevin about the Great Conjunction, where we were really looking at all the planets in the evening sky. Well, things transition, right? The Earth moves around the sun, our perspective of the solar system changes. And so for the last several months, these have been morning. There is going to be, and you're going to hear about this on the news, and we're going to react to it for you and with you. Um, in the middle of June, essentially every planet will be on this side of the sun and sort of and in the morning, and it'll be this huge line of planets. So, so this is most of them here. Venus and Mercury in the next month are going to also move over into that scene. And so we're going to do some programming on June the 15th uh, to show you about this and what's happening and really what's happening in space. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about how odd it is to have all the planets essentially on one side of the solar system. Um, but here's something you can look at coming up. And so I have now the scene is organized uh, to be uh, at a, just before sunrise. So it's still just starting to get light out. And you can see the pattern, this, the planets that you will be able to see are going to be uh, Jupiter and Mars is up there too, right next to Jupiter, I think, if I remember right. Uh, uh, Pluto, Saturn. And uh, the moon is also kind of in the view over here. And I'm just going to bump ahead um, uh, one day at a time. And so watch the moon in the, uh, the right hand side of of the program here. Let me see if I have this set up right. And so this is Friday the 28th, the end of this month, a week from Friday, uh, and the moon will start entering the scene over here. And then this will be uh, the 29th. You won't see Pluto, but the moon will be passing Pluto. And then the moon will move a little bit further on the, on the uh, this is the May 30th, May 31st, passing Saturn. June 1st, right next to Jupiter, uh, moving along, hard to see Neptune without a telescope, and then it's kind of like, like getting becoming more and more a crescent as it moves. So in um, uh, astronomy speak, we call those conjunctions. I'm going to just move it backwards here, so to like get it back into the scene again. Uh, we call those conjunctions. And what that means is that uh, one object is appears to be sort of next to another one or just passing each other in space. And so um, I always like to give you um, an uh, a, a sort of a, a something to look for. Uh, this particular program is about you sort of like tuning in with your computer and watching us with your technology. Uh, but this is all meaningless unless you actually get out into the sky and into the night sky and uh, look at the stars and look at phenomenon observe the lunar eclipse, do all those things that we need to do to stay connected to the sky. Uh, so here's an opportunity for you. Uh, between now and our next program, uh, this little adventure of the moon moving through this line of planets uh, will, uh, will be there. Uh, so look look for it beginning about Friday the 28th. Unfortunately, you have to get up really, really early in the morning. Maybe you could just go out and take a peek and then make some coffee and get on with your day. Um, um, I'm going to uh, sort of leave this behind, kind of bring the program to a close. I wanted to make sure everybody understands what we're doing next week. We have, um, we've never done this on our program before. We've never had the subject of exoplanets. And so exoplanets are planets that are around other stars. So uh, it wasn't that long ago that this was just sort of an uh, idea, a speculation. There must be planets out there. But with the last about 20 years, 25 years, we've discovered more and more and more and more exoplanets. Now we're actually imaging solar systems in space. And so I'm bringing a, a very special guest, uh, Dr. Jenny Patience, who does research in this area. Um, she is really active in the field. She does a lot of work uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, observatories, both in Chile and Hawaii, and uh, work with colleagues. And they, uh, they produce a tremendous body of knowledge about exoplanets and learning about early solar systems and what they do. So that's really going to be the big subject of our meeting uh, two weeks 
from now on June the 1st. And then I already said uh, June the 15th will be much more about planets. And then on, uh, we actually have three shows in June, now go figure. So uh, June the 1st, June the 15th, and June the 29th, we'll be back with you. And that will be, um, uh, we're gonna have a visit, actually a tour of our meteorite vault. And uh, the guest then will be Dr. Lawrence Garvey. And uh, he is a curator of meteorites in our particular center from uh, Busick Center for Meteorite Studies. And uh, that will be an, an, an interesting show. So uh, maybe for a once in a lifetime, I've actually finished on time. So I want you to uh, remember you're going to get an e email from Kim. Uh, it'll tell you, give you an opportunity to survey and send us a little comment and uh, some notes about what we talk about, uh, some things you might want to hear about, some things you like. And uh, uh, that would be really super for us to know because that's how we program our shows. On behalf of everybody that's in the background here, I want to offer a big thanks to Kevin O'Donnell for being a part of the program, to Patrick Young, who was in and then out, had to leave, and uh, uh, to all of the people that helped put this program together. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much for joining.